Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this webcast on addressing race, racism, and social justice in world language classrooms. I'm Tony Jackson. I'm Vice President for Education and Director of the Center for Global Education at Asia Society. And this webcast is one of a series of webcasts called Teaching Truth to Power. Within, within Asia Society's mission to create bridges of understanding between the people of Asia, the United States, and the world, our focus within the Center for Global Education is to partner with institutions in the world to educate all students for employability and citizenship in a global era. And we do that through scholarship, through developing resources for educators and policymakers, by bringing together Asian and American and global stakeholders to exchange knowledge and perspectives. And as in this webcast, by amplifying the voices of educators who are helping students to navigate cultural boundaries. In this instance, helping students develop one of the strongest deterrents to racism and racist thinking that anyone who can really imagine, and that is being able to speak the language of others who are very different from yourselves. Through all of our work to promote global learning at the Center for Global Education, what we have is a relentless commitment to equity and specifically for nearly two decades, the Center for Global, Edu global Education has advanced education for global competence as an approach to educational reform and as a way to develop in youth a mindset that abhors and actively works against racism and inequality. Among other things, education for global competence requires engaging children in experiences designed to develop empathy and to counter the kind of innate psychological mechanism of othering that is at the heart of prejudice. Learning someone else's language does just that. And through the dialogue that, that learning someone else's language allows, it enables us to understand others' cultures and to see each other as authentic human beings with some of the same kinds of hopes and fears and dreams that we have. So not an other, but a brother or a sister in the broad human family. In today's webcast, we'll have a chance to expand our own global competence by hearing from teachers as they address their own experiences as they relate to racism and what they do to help their students understand and overcome racialized prejudice. To take us forward, I'm extremely pleased to turn the proceedings over to Dr. Neelam Chadowry who is the Executive Director of Global Learning at Asia Society. Over to you, Neelam. Thank you, Tony. Welcome, everybody. And as Tony has already stated, we have a very exciting program for you today. So the research is clear. Students who speak another language do better academically and think more creatively, have access to a wider variety of jobs, and can more fully engage and participate in other cultures or converse with people from diverse backgrounds. However, the American Councils for International Education Survey, which sought state-by-state -state data on enrollment in rural language courses, estimates that only 10.6 million K-12 students in the United States are studying a rural language or American Sign Language. That's only one out of every five students, or approximately 20% of the student population in the United States. It is often stated that the study of a world language can influence the attitudes and behavior of learners, one of the goals of language teaching is to challenge stereotypes and encourage learners to engage with the cultural forms that can be accessed through a new language. Through learning a language, it is hoped that learners will draw on their experiences to reflect critically on their own cultures and identities. We hope to unpack some of these issues in our panel discussion today. And I am now pleased to introduce our esteemed group of educators who have spent much of their careers focused on integrating world languages into US schools. So first we have Lin Tao. She was born and raised in China. She received an associate's degree from the Sichuan International Studies University and later earned a master's in business administration from the University of Liverpool in the UK. The United States is a third continent she has resided in within the last 10 years. She has lived in Indonesia, the United Arab Emirates and Ghana before moving to the United States with her family in 2014. Two interesting facts about Lin are that she is an avid runner and that she has summited Mount Kilimanjaro back in 2013. We also have Kathleen Wong. She is a lead founder of the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School in Western Massachusetts. 
Her school is a K-12 public charter school with a diverse student body from over 30 rural, suburban, and urban communities. All students are required to take Chinese, and the high school is an international baccalaureate diploma program. This is Kathleen's 14th year as principal, and she has almost 20 years of experience in education. She enjoys nature, hiking, and learning new things. Hyun Lu has been a Chinese teacher since 1993. She is passionate about employing comprehensible input-based instruction in her classes and implementing mindfulness in education. She is a mindfulness coach for her school's track and field team and the volleyball team. She has been training and coaching language teachers throughout North America and Asia. Hyun is a co-founder of the Comprehensible Midwest Conference, Learn Together Academy, and also co-founded Ignite Chinese. She is a blogger and writer. She has written 16 storybooks in Chinese. When Hyun is not teaching, she likes to hike, meditate, drink tea with friends, enjoy a good meal with family, and play games with her son. Finally, we have Jennifer Wu Pope. She is currently a Chinese teacher in the Half Hollow Hills School District in New York. She has about 15 years of experience in the K-12 classroom, having also taught French and English in, as a new language. She has worked with pre-service teachers at the university level and has presented at national and state world language conferences. She is passionate about building students' cross-cultural understanding and global competence skills. Last year, she participated in the Fulbright Distinguished Awards in a teaching semester research program in Singapore. Her future goals are to write a children's book and to climb all 35 peaks in the Catskills Mountains. And finally, last but not least, I am pleased to introduce our moderator for the, this afternoon, Cleopatra Wise. Cleopatra is the Director for Asia Society's Center for Global Education, China Learning and Initiatives. She is responsible for managing the CLI group and executing programs that promote Chinese language learning among young people in the United States. Before joining Asia Society, Cleopatra lived and worked in China for eight years. Cleopatra holds a BA in International Relations from the University of Southern California. She also earned an MBA from the Guanghua School of Management at Peking University. Cleopatra is probably one of the most dynamic people I know. She is a Florida native uh, Florida native, and she speaks fluent Mandarin Chinese and West African Creole. So with that, Cleo, I will leave it to you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Neelam, for that wonderful introduction. And I would like to say, first of all, thank you all for coming and joining uh, this webinar. And thank you to all of the panelists. I'm so excited to have a dynamic conversation around addressing racism, race, um, and equity issues in the world language classroom. So I'm just gonna kick it off with a, with a very easy question uh, first, which is what influenced your decision to become a teacher of world language and how long have you been teaching? And I'll have uh, Lu Hayun uh, start it off. Thank you, Cleo. Thank you, Lilam, for the invitation. First of all, I wanted to express my gratitude for you organize this uh, webinar is much needed as very timely. Um, speaking of what influenced me to become a teacher, I wanted to become a teacher since I was seven years old. My first grade teacher inspired me. That, that was just like a, since I was a young child, I had this seed in my heart. I want to become a teacher. I graduated from Henan Normal University, taught in an elementary school in China for a few years, then immigrated here. So it was quite a just a natural progression to become a language teacher, continue to teach because I was teaching Chinese back in China. Um, I, so I have been a teacher for more than 20 years, uh, teaching Chinese as a second language for 16 years at my current school. This is, is my 14th year working at a university school of Milwaukee. Very glad to be here. Thank you, Haiyun. And I'll also pass this question on to Kathy, who is not a teacher, but a founder. So could you tell us a little bit about why you decided to found an immersion school um, and what uh, inspired you to become an educator? So thank you for having me here. Um, I, I agree with Haiyun. This is an extremely timely topic. Um, and I hope it's not the first and only one. We have to continue these dialogues. Um, I think I was influenced in part, I grew up in this country, but my parents were immigrants and spoke um, Chinese as a second language. My dad was a teacher for almost four, 40 years. Um, 
So education was always an important part of our, our household. Um, contrary to what some might think, looking at my face, they weren't like tiger parents. They were artists, actually, um, and um, never pressured us as children. But I got into this because um, we were, as one of the founders, um, if you look at language education in Massachusetts and even you know, broader in the United States, very few young children in elementary school have access to it. Um, and that really didn't make sense given where the world is and has been. Um, you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, the future, the future is global. Well, we're in the future. Um, and it takes, it takes effort of all of us to try to think broadly in terms of giving young students. So our school starts in kindergarten, but giving them that experience to go to school with each other. So the design of our school was very much born out of some, some of my own experiences growing up and not really having language education as a young kid, but looking also at other countries. Um, and, you know, my parents spoke other languages because they had to or they grew up with it. Um, and uh, they came from modest backgrounds. So I think the number one reason is really we, we have it as our responsibility to make society better. I am a child of the 1960s. So the talk about civil rights, um, inequity, um, the data around um, how schools are structured uh, nationally is pretty obvious that change needs to happen. So that's sort of my short story. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. I think all of us on this call have had our personal interactions in terms of race and dealing with racism. And so before we start to talk about um, how this is affecting all of you in the classroom and what you're doing in the classroom, I did want to touch on a little bit about your personal background. And so um, the next question really is around you know, as a person of Chinese heritage, everyone on this call is a person of Chinese heritage, except for myself. Um, what uh, what have you experienced in terms of racism or injustice in either your personal or professional life? Um, and so I'll have Jennifer Wu start uh, this conversation. Hi, and uh, thank you also for uh, having me on this panel. Um, it's an honor to be among such experienced educators. Um, for me, uh, personally, the first, the most recent experience actually was surrounding um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, I had been in uh, Singapore on my um, research program. And so there I was researching global competence. And so how they approach it is uh, looking at appreciation of diversity. They look at empathy building. Uh, they look at uh, racial harmony, etc. So while I was there, the uh, COVID um, Corona, the coronavirus broke out. And so I got to see how they responded to it, not just with safety measures, but also the social responses, as well as the educational responses. Um, I saw them do perspective taking, um, just so that um, learning from their experience with SARS, they would not have certain groups be stigmatized. So they, they really focused on preserving social unity. Uh, so because of the, uh, the pandemic, when it reached uh, global proportions, uh, the program was canceled. I came back home to New York when it was the epicenter of the pandemic, uh, of the out outbreak here. And so here uh, I, I um, experienced microaggressions for being a Chinese speaker, for um, just being in the community, uh, just speaking Chinese with a family member out in public, um, experiencing responses from uh, people, or even just returning back to school and being treated uh, differently than I had when um, before I left. So this was uh, my most recent experience. Yeah, you definitely bring up uh, something that I think a lot of Chinese Americans or people of Chinese heritage have uh, talked about uh, during the course of the pandemic, which is racism directly correlated with um, the pandemic and COVID-19. Can anyone else speak to that, whether it be your personal or your professional life? Uh, 
Um, I, I can sort of uh, share some experiences. I think um, COVID-19 certainly is the most recent sort of highlight on Asia. Um, what it, for me, however, having grown up here with immigrant parents, um, there are things in daily life that are, I would say, you get used to it in some sense, like people saying, oh, you speak, you speak English really well, or oh, you speak English, or uh, where are you from, or uh, uh, not being able to pronounce your name, or things like that. So there, to me, racism is, it can be a collection of assumptions about who you are, right? And so, you know, one thing being Asian, there is, there's, there's some negative stereotypes, but there's also this, you know, the, the people have probably heard the term model minority. Well, that also can, can lead to, um, you know, detrimental feelings about identity and things too, if you don't live up to that or blah, blah, blah. It also gets into hitting races against each other and, and, and all kinds of discussions that get much, much deeper. But I, I think COVID in itself um, was, it surfaced its surfaces stuff, not just for Asians, but for other races like like um, blacks or Latinos or people of color or women or uh, transgender, it, it surfaced a lot of things that were already there. Um, and I think that is what um, people really need to continue these dialogues. And in terms of language education, you know, one of the goals of our school is through language and through um, serving a region of service that is very large. We want kids of many different backgrounds to come together in school. And um, you know, we support 39 communities in the rural, suburban, and urban um, uh, county. The urban county has two of the poorest cities in Western Mass. The rural county is actually the poorest county in um, uh, Massachusetts. Um, and this is social economic data. I don't mean to say that the, the, the people have deficits. I think the, the sad part with our education system and it's systemic is the way education is organized and funded. Um, you know, in Massachusetts, it's through property tax um, and, you know, there's historic reasons, but I, I think, I think these events like COVID or, or, um, you know, horrific uh, things we see in the media are highlight points, but it's like when you see the tip of the iceberg and depending on how they're broadcast or depending on how they're um, interpreted opens up the dialogue and it opens up scars, which are historic, which can also prevent people from moving forward. And so, um, you know, I very much think language education is important. I very much think that having students, having children go to school with children from different backgrounds is absolutely essential because then you do get, um, you know, what Dr. Jackson was talking about, you get authentic experiences. Um, we wanted to start with kindergarten because five-year-olds just, they just play. They don't, they don't, judge someone as as harshly as adults may judge them or or some adults it's very implicit and very subconscious right it's more at least out front i mean children can they're learning their social skills they're learning their their about other people so those are things that i think are really both policy issues and systemic things that um will change how people are how people view each other so to piggyback on that, Cassie, I think uh, also probably piggyback on both Cassie and uh, Jennifer's comment about the racism in daily life. A lot of the times I think it's not people intentionally to be racist, to be racism. And a lot of times it's probably ignorance. And uh, my example I can, I can raise here is actually um, in allow me to use that as a teaching moment. Um, one of my African-American student, um, she was a grade nine student, so it's just a freshman, and uh, in the class, and then she just raised her hand. It's like, 
Miss Tao, can I ask you a question? Has nothing to do with what you are teaching. I'm like, okay, what is it? And she says, well, you know, um, you people at the nail salon, they were so good at their job. Where did they learn that? <laughs> so she's only a freshman. I don't think she intentionally want to categorize Chinese people as nail salon people. <laughs> but she just expressed that in a way that for some other people who is more sensitive, they might consider that to be racist or to be racism. So I actually used that as a teaching moment. This is the time we can talk about culture. We can talk about what Chinese people do in the other areas in this country, contribute to the society and so on. So just piggy, piggyback on that, I just thought um, what Kathy and Jennifer has uh, um, talked there is very important to start young when they um, still don't have their mindset yet and in, set in a way that uh, stereotype people around them and the microaggression that Jennifer has mentioned. And I think they are, it's very important to um, start that dialogue at very young age. I, that's what I want to. Yeah, um, I think both what all of you are touching on in terms of the equity issues in the United States and also, you know, um, your personal issues addressing race have been very much highlighted through the course of 2020 um, uh, through COVID, um, but also uh, through the murder of George Floyd. I think for all of us uh, watching the video of George Floyd um, being murdered by the police was a kind of shock to the system um, in the United States. And that video, you know, I have a lot of friends in China and that video was widely shared um, across the world. And a lot of my Chinese friends had a lot of questions for me, you know, in terms of how could this happen and what, uh, what are people doing to address it? And in general, um, how, you know, America is responding. And so uh, for the first time, at least in my lifetime, I think it's been uh, an opportunity for us to reflect on race and to reflect on racism in the United States um, and, and have real conversations on every single level and education is, is definitely one of those levels. So I would love to get a sense of, you know, what have you seen um, as the biggest challenges for your students to deal with equity and to deal with social injustice? Um, and I'll first direct this question to uh, Kathy. I'd be glad to um, answer that. In fact, right before this webinar, um, I had a meeting with, um, I'm a club advisor to one of our high school clubs. It's the um, Black Student Union. And so uh, our students have um, discussions about race and equity every week in the club and we hold events and town meetings and things like that. So um, I actually posed this question to them and they are high school students. Um, the first thing they said was gaining knowledge. And I think if you ask them more deeply, I said, well, are you talking about history? Are you talking about um, knowledge about contemporary events? Are you talking about you know, news and how to analyze it. And they just said something to the effect of understanding how we got where we are. And, you know, it may sound, I think, um, you know, and we, we teach all kinds of history. Um, we try very much to have kids engaged in extracurricular activities that talk about race and ethnicity or um, supporting inclusive environments. We have an entire social emotional curriculum that spans K through 12. Um, and we've also tried to create safe spaces. So we have something called a peace room where kids can go to not only, they, they can just go themselves to talk if they have a free, free period during the day. I mean, we've created this all virtual now because we're, we're operating um, virtually now. But um, I think it's a really important question to say, how did we get here? But they always say, why can't we fix it faster? And you know, teenagers and young people 
ask these really profound questions that sound like obvious questions. But now, you know, again, I, I grew up in the 1960s. What my students tell me is, okay, it's been decades. How come nothing's changed really? And I think that is the question for us as adults. And I also pose the, to them saying, you're, you're young adults. What do we have to do? Because um, it, is, it is beyond heartbreaking to see tragedy live streamed in some cases um, around the world. Um, and so collectively, I'm, I'm a big sort of collectively collaborative type, how do you build this together? And I, I also try to say to the students um, and myself, we share responsibility we should not finger point. And it sounds cliche, but it's really, really important for people to have discussions like this today and just be honest about it and say, we have to go forward. We have to do something. Um, so I believe very much in the power of small teams to do things. I believe very much in the power of idealism. Um, and I think, you know, the panel here, I'm very interested in hearing their perspective also because it's not only people who grow up here. I think the United States has an amazingly rich heritage of immigration and people who come to study here or our own students going to other countries or even, even visiting another state or city is really important, but getting perspective, I think is one of the key, key pieces that I've learned from my students and also in terms of how we can move this forward. Thank you, Kathy. And I'll uh, uh, address that same question to the rest of the panel. I'd like to add to uh, what Kathy had said. Um, so I completely agree that th the kids are looking at us as adults for um, like some kind of direction and I think some kind of hope as well. And, and what Pauline had said before, using those um, learning opportunities, whether it's impromptu in the classroom, or even just as world language teachers, we have this potential, this opportunity to have these types of um, discussions on culture and our views on identity and on ethnicity, etc. And, and so allow students to analyze not just their own identities as they're developing them, but also help guide them towards appreciating the diversity of the culture that they're learning. So whether it's, um, let's say Chinese culture, just Chinese culture is so diverse, are we going to only focus on Han culture or are we going to also incorporate um, ethnic minority groups too? So I think giving students that um, bigger picture of what the real world looks like so that they're able to um, have more, uh, cross-cultural skills to eventually interact with maybe these different um, groups in Chinese-speaking countries or even just in diverse teams, maybe in their jobs. That's definitely yeah. great. Well, for me, I said, sorry, go ahead. I mean, go ahead. Are you sure? Okay, so to echo back on what Kathy and Jennifer said, um, I think there's a three areas that particularly are challenging for students. One, our teacher lack proper trainings to undo unconscious bias within us, which is created by systematic racism, you know, media influence, culture, history, how curriculum's being taught in school. We don't have the proper tool even we have the awareness, we can't just walk into classrooms to have a conversation. So the conversation needed to be held in a very safe, supportive way. So people can give, express their concerns, give their voice. Teachers need a training to be there to truly to support the students and they hold a space for all students to raise their voice. Uh, without to be able to create that place, we might only hear the voice that we wanted to hear, but we are not hearing the voice, which is also there 
without hearing the voice which make us uncomfortable, we can work through the issues. Uh, so number two, I think students lack a proper platform, a platform to learn to grow, like Kathy said, they wanted to know how, how did we get here? And how do we undo that? And uh, where can I go? Who can I go to? Uh, what is the resources out of there? How could I undo this? I think that's the second challenge. Third challenge, I really think, is school needs more outreach program to bring parents on board on the same page. So we, um, if, if a school curriculum is completely separate from what they hear from their family, then we are not really reaching this group of children and then they, with a diverse families. So that's what I'm thinking. Thank you, Hyun. And Talen? And for, yeah, for me, I think it's probably um, in, from a personal level, I think that um, you could not, you could only do that much to change the whole picture. We all can contribute to that, but we could only do that much to change the whole picture. And uh, with my experience, as I have uh, um, talked about my school background before, our school is a heritage um, black school. It was founded in 1918, and, but um, so historically, we did not have any other um, ethnicity group to join to um, attend our school until 1973. So by this point, we probably have about 40% um, African-American um, students, about 40 uh, Caucasian students and uh, about 20 others. And uh, so I have about 60% students, they are African-American. And I do not just teach Chinese, I also have ACT prep, uh, prep group, uh, program to prepare them, um, participate in the an entr entrance exam test to college and so on. And what I have observed in my classroom is a lot of times the students have a victim mentality they view themselves as a victim of the society. In a way, I absolutely agree with them that they have been victimized as the minority in the society for way too long. And as Kathy has mentioned, why it has not changed over the decades? That is a question we do need to ask. And but I want to convey my message to my students if you keep yourself in that victim mentality, you will con constantly think the society is not fair to you, which yes, it is. I'm not suggesting them to stop fighting. What I always suggest them to do is you have to get yourself out of that mindset. You have to start from the individual level, do something, change your own situation, and reach that to the community and becoming a circle, a rippling circle. And then you will see the change to the society level. So that's my approach. That's my um, view on this one. I think it, especially what I have observed, like I said, that the African-American society, the students, they view them as victim for way too long. I think they need to jump out of that loophole. I love your statement in terms of, um, you know, making sure to encourage your students to uh, move past a victim kind of mentality um, and change their own individual circumstances. And one of the things that I always like to convey um, to our partner schools, particularly that are in rural and, uh, you know, low income neighborhoods and communities is that Chinese is definitely a way in which those students can achieve. So I would love to ask a question, which I know I definitely did not send to any of you, but how do you see Chinese as being influential uh, to deal with equity issues for lower income and, and students in uh, rural communities? Okay, Kathy. <laughs> well, um... I love this topic. <laughs> um, it goes to 
defining a student's identity. I think if I go back to um, one definition that I, I sort of allude to, that racism is people making assumptions about you based on your race. Um, we're trying, and what we've seen, what the effect of learning Chinese, because every student takes Chinese, and the majority of our, our students have zero Chinese heritage or uh, language background. Um, it's really shown them that they can redefine their identity. And in most cases, it's a really positive thing because for example, a student who doesn't look Chinese, it may start speaking Chinese, you know, out of outside of our school or in whatever situation they may find themselves in, or they may just tell somebody they speak Chinese and they witness the reaction of the person and they're surprised that the other person is surprised. So in some sense, they're seeing almost an opposite effect of like, why would you think that's odd? Every kid in my school takes Chinese, right? So in their worldview, everybody takes Chinese, right? But when they step out of our school, the reaction is, I would have never expected that. And so they actually see a form of racism in that people assume that a person who doesn't have an Asian face cannot speak Chinese. And so for some of our students, what it's done is redefine their sense of who they are because they were getting feedback from people saying, whoa, I never expected, you know, a kid, you know, a Latino kid to speak Chinese, right? Or I never expected, you know, a non-Asian student to speak Chinese. For, for some of our students, this is just mind blowing because I think there have been, for some of them, certainly the older ones who had more sort of social messaging sort of like thrown at them. It's mind blowing because they, they see themselves in a new light that they never may have thought society saw them in. And to me, that's an issue of the way society views you based on who you look like or who you're, you know, what you look like, that is daily judgmental racism or, or um, boxing you into a certain, a certain um, you know, profession or skill level or ability or things like that. So I see Chinese as being in some sense level setting and putting everybody almost on uh, um, a similar level because none of them had it when they entered. Um, and we're, we try to take data in terms of, you know, academic data clearly, but we also um, try to understand social emotional effects. Because if you give a kid a possibility and an opportunity that they may never have thought they could do, and then they do well at it, defying stereotypes or redefining their identity, that helps overall self-esteem and social emotional growth, which you know, go hand in hand with what they then do post-secondary and what they can then dream about. And I think that's the beauty of education. Um, so that's my answer. That's nicely put. And Bu Haiyun? Yes, I would like to add that because the Chinese has a notorious reputation for being hard, it has been traditionally treated, or nowadays still be treated as an elite program. Uh, people without a lot of time, resources, dedication, and uh, most people won't succeed. So what I really believe is nothing motivates like a success. How can we empower students, um, have them believe, trust, and it's in there, every single cell in the body, I can do this. That's really the main reason I'm so committed to comprehensible input-based instruction because it gives every student a chance to succeed. So in terms of equity, can we make Chinese so accessible, comprehensible, compelling for every single kid in our classroom? So I, we, we do need, as a teacher, we gotta start with us as well. Can we improve our teaching methodologies? Yes, and so I'm going to transition to kind of the meat and potatoes of the conversation. I think 
uh, oftentimes when we talk about race, when we talk about equity, we talk about it in very abstract terms. And so I really want to get down into the practical uh, terms as all of you are either uh, a school leader like Kathy or a Chinese teacher actually teaching in the classroom. And so I wanted to get a sense of what are you doing um, in your classroom to address you know, social injustice and, and, and equity. So maybe I'll open it up um, to Jennifer first. So um, there's multiple ways of addressing this. So, uh, so going to um, first looking through the lens of, of uh, critical pedagogy, for example, alluding to kind of what I was saying before, how we have as world language teachers kind of a responsibility to treat culture not as just a discrete, discrete set of facts, but it's actually there's a socio-political dimension, right? So how we're forming the target culture in our students' minds is how they're going to perceive what they're learning and um, ultimately the, the people groups that they're interacting with. So um, what I do in, in, in my class is I use, so I use a lot of imagery, right, for, for context. So um, I'll add a lot of um, diverse. So for example, if we're, if we're in the unit on like travel and countries and nationalities, they will not just see uh, representations of, of Chinese people as just the, you know, the, the Han, which is like the stereotypical uh, view of Chinese people as, as, as the Han group, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll put in um, images also of, of like Chinese Muslims. There's um, Chinese, uh, the Miao group or the Yi group, right? So, so that they see you know, different clothing, different um, types of uh, the, um, I guess the, the, the depth of, of what, um, I guess, what Chinese, right, means to be. But, but, but I, I don't just box it in. So, so I, I like to 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 always give my students also the disclaimer that it, it's very difficult. We can't just um, set these boundaries and say, okay, if you are Chinese, you must like to drink tea. You must only like to drink tea, and that's not true. And that's not what we want to teach the kids. So I think it's important to um, see design our lessons through that lens of of critical pedagogy and, and critical consciousness. Um, Another example is um, I, I give my students opportunities to do perspective taking. So where they, uh, for example, in the transportation unit, they might um, not just learn about different modes of transportation. I teach novice level, uh, novice low intermediate level students. So not, they don't just learn different modes of transportation, but they look at, okay, if you're doing this mode of transportation, how might someone feel if, um, let's say they're taking up a seat and they're an elderly person, or if um, like uh, during COVID, you know, I had them think about, okay, well, there are some news stories. How do you think um, these uh, Asian uh, passengers felt um, when they were, you know, treated this way on the subway? Um, and then also um, th there's just so many ways we can incorporate the opportunity for students to uh, reflect about their own identity. So it could be their racial identity, it could be their um, ethnic identity, but, but because these things come about in our classrooms, we can't avoid them. You know, we talk about them in our, in our classes. Um, I, I think we, we have that responsibility to really treat it in a way that is um, empowering for the students and, and gives them the opportunity to also grow uh, as individuals um, and, and also have the cross-cultural skills to bring forward for the future. Thank you, Jennifer, for that explanation. Um, how about uh, Lu Haiyun? Uh, Jennifer, that was great. You give lots of examples um, to talk about how to avoid presenting information from a single side story. Um, that's my first point. Um, so um, here's an example about a single side story and uh, also how to really be aware and conscious to catch our own 
conscious bias. Uh, my son took a Spanish class and then he also has a tutor um, on Friday evening. It's a fabulous teacher. I absolutely in love with her. She just fabulous. So last Friday, so she presented a little story as two girls and she's using honest, dishonest, so on and so forth. And this is for a group of Chinese children. And she dropped in a picture, um, gave her name, Kathy, uh, just happened to be Kathy, a white woman. She asked, is she honest or dishonest? The group of Chinese kids said, no, she's a dishonest. And this teacher said, no, 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 she is honest. And then she dropped in another picture, it's an African-American girl. Is she honest or dishonest? And then the kids said, honest. And then she said, no, 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 she is a dishonest. This is a fabulous teacher. Is she aware, conscious, doing, reinforce this stereotypical white is better than black? No, I don't think she's conscious of that. But this is why to fight against our unconscious bias, so not to reinforce this belief of white is better than black. Uh, if we, if I didn't have the class, I didn't take those uh, talks, webinars, I wouldn't see that as a problem either. So that's the uh, how we can uncheck our own unconscious bias to not presenting material reinforce a single side story. My second point would be offering a holistic curriculum that truly address equity, uh, justice, injustice, anti-racism. For example, um, one of my, I have three examples here. One of my go-to resources I use in my class is called the that Dollar Street it was founded by Anne Gosling from Sweden. Um, she sent tons of photography when in 50 different countries uh, in visit 263 families. Basically, it's just like putting everyone, uh, imagine everybody lives on one street based on their income level, the left is the poorest, the right is the richest. And when we break down people by their income level, it doesn't matter. What is your skin color? What's your race? What's your family, culture, country? The bathroom, if you only have a monthly income of $30, you're going to use the pit toilet outside. And once you reach this above monthly income, let's say $3,000, you're going to live in a comfortable house, have a refrigerator, have a bedroom called your own. So that helped to really break through the stereotype for, oh, these people in that country, in that race, they do this or that. Um, that is pretty much my go-to resource. Bedroom? Okay, sure. Let's look at the bedroom around the world. Which income level you want to see? You want to see someone's living room, utensil, toothbrush? Um, when people below $200 monthly income, the whole family share one toothbrush and they tie it on a tree, in a string on a tree. Whoever need to use it, they use it. It doesn't matter which continent you live in. So that's number one, human in New York. That's my secondary resources. I go to there quite a lot. Um, so I, in a uh, few years ago, I, my first set of children book, actually Chinese curriculum in my kitten use cats, kitten theory. I purposely have a black cat in the story and also it's parallel to the Western culture, black cat is unlucky because it's a black. So the students, um, some kids always catch up. Miss Lu, why are you write about racism in your story? Now after George Floyd, it was just like, duh, no brainer. Yes, we needed to talk about this in our curriculum. So um, lastly, what I wanna say, what I do is being inclusive and not exclusive with our materials. So I came from a mainland, so I know a lot about mainland's custom tradition, even terminology. I don't know much about Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. I especially don't know about those Chinese speaking regions, let's, let's say uh, in Malaysia. 
uh, in those, they, they have a really strong Chinese program. So I have a friend that we have a network online. So just like today, we, we were talking about the house chores. I learned from my Taiwanese friend, teachers, uh, instead of jiawuhuo, they call jiashi. It's like a di dao dao di, all those terms. So I do one way in, okay, mainland say this, but here is what's in Taiwan. Um, in our curriculum, we, we can't just only talk about, okay, I'm from mainland, I'm gonna talk everything about mainland. What about Angel Island? What about railroad? What about gold rush? And I didn't know uh, during the same gold rush period, there's a lot of people come to the US. There's tons of people went to Africa. I was like, oh my God, I need to find a resource to teach you that. That means we've been inclusive and not exclusive. So thank you. Yes, that's wonderful. And I think you highlighted some great resources. So we'll make sure to put that um, in the uh, those resources in the description as well. Um, Talin? Well, for me, I think uh, um, I teach high schoolers. So they are young adults and uh, their mindset is slightly different from, uh, you know, a middle schoolers or elementary kids. They are more mature. They view the world as almost an adult point of view. And for me, and I think a lot of times when I'm in class, I actually veer away from just Chinese language. Um, I think a very important thing I do is I have discussion with the students head on, um, hard discussions, just based on the current um, affairs. For example, uh, some, some of those affair, uh, uh, events happen so close to home. I use those moments all the time. And yes, we discuss them in English because in this case, I think Chinese is not enough to express what they actually have. And then example being in 2017, um, Terence Crutcher, and he was shot um, by a policewoman in Tulsa. And he actually have nephews and the nieces attend my school. And so that was a very hated moment um, in the whole community, not just my school, the whole Tulsa community. And I used that as a, a, a teaching moment. We just had a, for a few days, my different levels, we just talk about what, how do you view these events? What is your insight on this particular um, occurrence in, I'm not even, it's an, a tragedy, a tragedy, not even an incident. And then um, another example would be um, the Tulsa Black Wall Street massacre. And I don't know any of you have heard of that. That is the probably the biggest um, racial violence of American history occurred in 1921 and May 31st and June 1st. And Tulsa Black Wall Street at the time is the most wealthiest um, community in the whole America. And, uh, and the white residents basically um, used an accident has happened, incident has um, happened and basically erased the whole community. Um, about 10,000 black um, people has left homeless. And then, so that has somehow, nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about it until um, in 20 years ago, people start to raise the issue. And then, so now it has been incorporated into um, the Oklahoma curriculum. So those are the moments they are so close to home. I use those moments to have a head on hard discussion with my students. No. Like I said, we don't use Chinese to discuss this, but I think it's important standing from a Chinese teacher point of view, from a totally different culture, did not have much of understanding about the racial injustice in America, how I facilitate this discussion and how do they see me as kind of an outsider um, looking into the issue? How would that uh, affect their thoughts, their insights? I think it's also very important. 
Thank you, Talin, especially um, relating it back to very local uh, events and, and local uh, instances of injustice is very important. Um, and Kathy, I would love to hear your perspective from the school uh, leadership point of view. Um, first, I think curriculum instruction, we've heard about that, staffing, training for staff. To me, those are foundational core pieces to address topics of racism. But what I wanted to sort of highlight and what we're trying to do is um, direct individual participation of the students. Um, and this gets into their own behavior in class towards each other. Um, you know, we have restorative practices um, and we start social emotional lessons uh, early on in all classes not only our Chinese classes. Um, and obviously students come from different backgrounds and it involves you know, uh, their parents and families. But at the individual student level, if we see a student or hear a student saying something that could be racist, we want to address that right away and stop class potentially, have a discussion in a safe environment. So we'll use restorative circles, uh, we set up a peace room, we have counselors, we provide training to our staff, but we want to have, you know, certainly when they're younger, it may be just ig ignorance, so to speak, but I think what well, by the time they get to, you know, upper elementary and middle school, we don't want to think that ignorance is a valid reason, if that makes sense, because it's also our responsibility as educators to reduce that ignorance. Um, so, the steps we take follow a process that is very much, first, we wanna make the students feel safe, but we also want people to acknowledge why, the, why a racist comment, for example, is a problem. Um, and then with using restorative practices, the participation of maybe the student who was hurt or um, a, a, another student or like a peer trained student or a high school student and we, we have a K-12 program so we, we try to have older kids come in. Um, so for example, if it was a statement about um, an African American student, we may want to bring in an older peer like high school student and come into elementary school or come into middle school to have a dialogue that's again safe but also the goal of that is to have somebody of that race in a moderated environment, have a honest discussion so that we can build empathy. And I think that individual um, participation, and it can be done in any classroom, it does take some time, but we, we find that the goal is by teaching the kids the skills to have the dialogue and also be able to relate to someone. Like it's easy, to say something hurtful if you don't know the person, right? We see that in social media, or it's easy to assume things about people about their race if you never actually have a conversation with a person of that race. It's abstract. We're trying to minimize that abstraction and just have the kids on a human to human, person to person level, be respectful and understand that we need to treat each other fundamentally, each as human beings. Um, we all have you know, unique characteristics, but fundamentally, it's a very basic thing. And, and in some sense, we want to teach them that this is just common sense, right? Um, and I think common sense isn't always common, <laughs> um, but we can hope and dream and try to do little steps to, to do it. Um, you know, we also have things like, you know, decorations in the classrooms and signage and everything. I, and those are absolutely great reminders, but I feel that that's, that's a superficial piece. We really need to get the human, the kids interacting. And then, of, kid, of course, behind every child is a parent or a guardian. So we also try, you know, in these situations where there may be a, a difficult dialogue about race or something, or somebody insulted someone or somebody said a racist comment, Bring in the parents, bring in the bring in the household, and try to have have people have this dialogue. So that's my answer. 
Thank you, Kathy. Um, those were really great words, particularly uh, emphasizing the human connection and the student to student uh, peer learning and peer sharing. So thank you all uh, for attending the panel. Um, we're gonna close now with uh, Neelam to say the closing remarks. Um, thank you all very much for your time um, and all of your thoughts. Thank you, Cleo, for moderating and a special thanks to the panelists for their honesty, thoughtfulness, and advocacy for world language programming. Your passion and commitment to the field is inspiring. Traditionally, language learning has been viewed as something that is technical or academic, and you have highlighted that it's so much more than that. It's dynamic, it's contextual, and in many ways, it's organic. And um, cultural identity, equity, and high achievement for all students are the hallmarks of global competence. And I think we have all been a bit reassured today about language education in this country, so thank you all very much. We will definitely keep this conversation going over the coming months. For our audience, please be sure to stay connected with Asia Society as we will bring more discussion about race, identity, and culture through our Teaching Truth to Power discussion series. We look forward to seeing you all soon and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye.